Can you hear the like? Have you been next to it? Like, whoa. My name's uh, Philip Ray Scott, and I like making um, yeah large abstract sculpture, mainly in metal. When I was building my studio, I was uh, finishing the gable ends and curving off the great roof on the side walls. I noticed that the corrugation lines, which start out sort of like this, by the bottom were, were just so sort of long and slender. This gave me the inspiration to try meeting two pieces of corrugation, and then three, and so on. Contrary to what you'd think, because they're hard-edged, geometric and straight, comes this amazing wobbly edge, almost by accident and kind of uncontrollably. And although this is a great, big, heavy looking thing, it's also got quite a nice, playful, soft sort of edge. Building my enormous studio, I felt enormously constrained and contained, and this piece is certainly um, an uncontainment of all that sort of built up stimulus and inspiration. By no means exclusively, but um, when I can, it's nice to use reclaimed or second-hand materials. And uh, this stuff in particular came from many, many different shipping containers. And it's lovely to think that it will have uh, traveled literally all over the world. So this piece has already had a sort of life before it turned into this. Core 10, also called weathering steel, uh, is one of my favorite materials to use as it sits in so well with the natural environment. Core 10 has got fantastic longevity, you know, with no, no paint. The elements uh, do the painting, which gives it a lovely natural feel. And the way the water trickles down certain bits, um, you just couldn't imagine it, you know, nature does the rest. As with making all large work, having a maquette is always a very useful thing. Having got these panels back to the studio, I measured them up very accurately and then hand folded a three and a half times scale model version of the panels. 34 small ones and 34 massive ones next to them. This allowed me to then make the maquette each element one at a time and the element following it would be slightly dictated by the one before in that they need to sort of balance um, technically but create a sense of sort of unbalance but coherency at the same time in that it doesn't all look like a sort of accident. With abstract sculpture um, it's important I think to have a few constraints to work within because otherwise you know, I'm going to end up with a mess. I decided that going with no more than a six-sided shape per element would be the maximum amount of detail that would be necessary to get in there, and that probably no more than eight elements would be right. And I like the idea of these toppling, stacking sort of things that uh, come together to create something kind of coherent, but also sort of, you know, slightly chaotic and slightly sort of unnerving. Yeah, like most people, like probably wouldn't really want to stand where I'm standing. They almost wouldn't, you know. I, I like the idea of that anyway. Having made my, um, my small scale maquette, I had to dream up some way of um, scaling up. And I certainly didn't know how when I started. I just had a good idea that it'd be possible. <laughs> and luckily it was. The first element I scaled up in a kind of um, point to point type system, um, just mathematically. It was an unbelievably long-winded process um, and completely stultifying and exhausting. But I knew that I just had to um, find an easier method or a quicker method because it had taken literally a month. I experimented um, with an, uh, an overhead projector but it's, it too was um, very long-winded and I still thought there must be an easier way. Eventually, I came up with the uh, process of wetting a piece of paper, smoothing it over each face on the model one at a time. I would then run round the edge of this face with a file, which um, would cut out the exact profile. Then, by marking the corrugation lines on it, removing it, drying it, and enlarging it on a photocopier, that would provide me with a, effectively a map or a template 
to lie over the big sheets of corrugation and then cut them out. Probably the uh, trickiest thing um, which has led to the most work is the fact that these factory made panels are incredibly inaccurate and escalate all over the place um, accuracy wise. So my small scale corrugations, they, they were absolutely accurate and therefore scaling up should have been fairly sort of uh, simple or slightly quicker than it was. But in, in reality, once I'd scaled up, there were huge voids everywhere and the joins were absolutely horrendous and needed an enormous amount of filling and grinding and filling and grinding. Behind the scenes, or um, behind the uh, totally polished or actually totally rusty exterior, there's um, a lot of structural work going on inside. Initially, I had the piece standing up in the workshop and there was just a, a terrifying amount of wobble. So I knew that some reinforcement was, was essential. I came to the conclusion that I would need an enormous piece of stainless steel tube to run up the entire way up the inside. So this meant dismantling each element one by one and passing this enormous piece of stainless steel tube up the inside. Unfortunately, it's not a straight line up through there. So this meant cutting it and crooking it and shaping it sort of all the way up through. Um, and this was a process of, yeah, a couple of months. It was also necessary uh, for the sake of longevity to fit an enormously thick piece of uh, core 10 on the base and it actually um, continues up the sides of the base um, for about four inches and is blended in completely seamlessly um, with the thinnest sheet above. That I mean, like, it's just mad, isn't it? You, what, you, you can't see it at all and that's about, uh, that was about three weeks work, yeah. After the piece was fully welded, it was necessary to get rid of all the weird colours that it was. So I took it uh, for shop blasting. That's the only thing which was done sort of off-site and not by me. The shop blasting has the effect of removing all of the paint and keying up the metal so that it rusts fairly sort of uniformly and fairly quickly as well, which is essential. Core 10 as a material, it turns out, likes to get wet and dry out. It occurred to me that the interior of this um, sculpture is likely to be constantly damp and therefore some protection against corrosion was necessary inside. The best way to protect the interior was with a sort of cavity wax that they use on cars. The best way to get that in, I felt, was to fill up each lump and slosh the thing around. I'm a great believer in the saying that uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Certainly this tricky process required one hell of a good invention. I decided on this insane method of um, spinning the piece around in my workshop like a madman. That's sort of me really, something ridiculous like that is me all over. By using the spirit levels and, and a certain amount of the liquid, 35 litres, you could guarantee that each face had been covered. It was a great pleasure to be able to fully utilise my enormous studio and uh, have this thing sort of scraping the ceiling. I like my big pieces not to have plinths where possible. I like the idea that they stand on the ground or perhaps they emanate from the ground in the way that a tree does. 
perhaps there's more going on underneath, going down to the Earth's core or something. This is a sort of eruption that's happened. My dad always says, um, classic how to make your life as difficult as possible by Philip Ray Scott. I certainly won't get myself in this, this pickle again, but I have pulled it off. <laughs>